good evening everyone welcome you all to this uh, academic session of oncology classroom as you all know that this month we are uh, discussing on gastrointestinal cancers today we are having another exciting topic on principles of contouring in hepato pancreatic or biliary system the name or the topic itself uh, signifies it's a huge topic it includes the principles of contouring for three different malignancies uh, liver cancer, pancreatic, and entire biliary system. And today we are having Dr. Kanika Sharma as our teacher. Dr. Kanika Sharma is one of the leading radiation oncologists in Delhi and Sierra, and she is working as a senior consultant and clinical lead at Dharamshila Narayana Super Specialty Hospital. Uh, Mam is very active in academic forum, and she is one of the wonderful teachers. Welcome you, Ma'am. Thank you so much for uh, giving your time and I know uh, it's my mistake that I uh, give a very short notice for this huge task and uh, thank you all uh, and thank you ma'am for uh, this wonderful effort. Uh, so uh, over, over to you ma'am and please uh, start your session. So I'm, st uh, I'm stopping sharing from my end and you can start sharing your screen. So first of all, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dudul, I think uh, very kind words on your part for this introduction. And I would want to congratulate you for this Herculean effort you are doing by assembling the teachers across the country and make it available to our students. I think they are lucky to have you do this for you because it is very difficult to find teachers across country at one forum to teach you such difficult topics which they would not be able to understand on their own because when you look at the books, it, they seem very easy, but when you practically do it and you sit on the contouring station, you may not actually appreciate what is mentioned in the book. So huge congratulations to you. And I think you need to allow me uh, the screen sharing option. Yes, ma'am, it's there. It, it says that, okay, now I have it, right. So uh, the topic which was allotted to me was principles of contouring of hepato pancreatic biliary malignancies. And one of uh, my areas of interest by virtue of uh, being married to a GI surgeon. So it a GI comes to me as a family tradition. So uh, thank you for giving me this topic, which is a close to heart topic of mine. During this class, we would try to uh, cover these topics, basically the anatomical consideration of this hepatobiliary system, the classifications, a bit about the imaging, and mainly our focus would be on the target delineation pertaining to the nodal stations in the upper abdomen and the primary CTV delineation in the biliary and the pancreatic tumors. So the principles of radiation, if you talk of, I don't think they have changed. Whenever you are planning radiation for any patients, there are some things which, which you have to keep in mind. What is the stage of the tumor? What is the uh, pattern of recurrence of this particular disease? What are the patterns of failures, nodal as well as locally, and also what is the natural history of the disease. So whenever you plan any patient, your basic information about that malignancy should include these factors. As in we are uh, uh, advancing in technology, the importance of delineation has become more important because initially our radiation volumes were wide. They were covering up for our uh, anatomical misses or geographical misses, but the modern technology is very unforgiving. So you have to have a very accurate target delineation. If you talk of the biliary and the pancreatic tumors, the guidelines for biliary are still evolving. We really don't have, uh, you know, we, I cannot say that we have found the ultimate contouring guidelines for them. Our understanding is coming from pathological studies and uh, every uh, few months, some papers are coming and as to understand how we can reform our previously existing guidelines. As for pancreas, we did have good uh, contouring guidelines, uh, which came in almost in 2012 for the post-op cases. But now there is a lot of transformation since our modus of treatment delivery is changing and the, uh, the arrival of SBRT, I would say, has been the game changer, wherein 
our patterns of contouring have drastically moved from ENIs to no donor irradiation and our limited volumes. We will talk briefly about them also, but since it is a teaching class, uh, we have more postgraduates, we will first restrict ourselves to the standard contours which we should be aware of. So if you talk of target delineation, any target delineation has few elements. We have to have the knowledge of the GTV, that is the gross tumor, which comes from your anat anatomical mapping. And anatomical mapping may be a single name, but the information for this anatomical mapping comes from multiple inputs, which would include the clinical findings, as well as the radiology in hand. And in post-op cases, it would also include the surgical findings and the histopathology report. Then next important factor is the microscopic disease extension, which is unique to each tumor. We have some information by biology of certain tumors that what extent they can extend into the adjoining tissues. And then comes from the series of studies which have reported the recurrence patterns, that these are the areas where tumor can fail. So these contribute towards the, the clinical target volume inputs. Nodal extensions, uh, there are uh, uh, anatomically, we know that these uh, particular tumors drain to a particular level of lymph nodes. Apart from that, the series of studies also try to evaluate what are the recurrence patterns. In general, if, if, if you talk of malignancy per se in whole, we usually treat nodal stations where there is a risk of failure more than 15% and some studies even 10%. But hepatobiliary are very unique. Even those nodal stations where the rate of failures are up to 3% have been considered significant. So this is one area which is different from rest of the body. Then the further elements come in into the contribution of PTV. PTV, we all know it is for accounting our setup errors as well as the organ motions in those areas which are closer to the diaphragm, particularly this malignancy, hepatopancreatic, uh, hepatobiliary, I would say, where there is an organ motion by virtue of its vicinity to the diaphragm and identification of organs at risk, which is, which is I think the most important in the hepatopancreatic malignancies because we typically are enveloped by a lot of uh, dose limiting OARs around our CTVs. So. so if you look at the anatomy of the hepatobiliary system, the hepatobiliary system basically is the drainage system of the liver, we can say. So the hepatic ducts from the different segments of the liver unite to form the common hepatic duct, which further is joined by a cystic duct, which comes from the gallbladder to form the common bile duct, which traverses vertically for a distance and goes and joins into the second part of the duodenum, where it exits the bile at the duodenal papilla. The pancreas, it, it is a sort of a, uh, an organ which is like punching into the duodenum. So it, the, the head rests into the second and the third part of the duodenum and the tail relatively is free and there is a pancreatic duct, we call it the Santorini duct, which traverses through the pancreas and goes and joins the common bile duct at the duodenal papilla. So by virtue of the vicinity, these uh, uh, the malignancies of these are clubbed together Although uh, biologically there is a difference in etiology, I think a lot of been, uh, things have been taught in the last uh, two classes and you know the path pathophysiology and a lot of things about the workup and the uh, management decisions. And why I chose this uh, backdrop? Because this backdrop particularly reminds me of upper abdominal organs, you know. All the viscera in the upper abdominals are twining and collecting to each other, just like this picture. So it may appear as a simple hepatobiliary system, but when you come to contouring, there are so many organs that everything looks gray and black unless you know how to identify these organs. So there is a lot of importance of identifying these organs because they appear to be simple when we, when we see 3D anatomy or when we see the uh, anatomical uh, dissection models we see, they appear simple. But when it comes to the axial anatomy, the upper abdominal anatomy is difficult, takes time, but I would say if you are following it regularly, it becomes very, very easy over a period of time. So we will start off with the vascular anatomy because vascular anatomy majorly plays role in the delineation of a lot of volumes in the upper abdominal malignancies, particularly the hepatobiliary. 
So the vascular anatomy, you need to, first of all, identify the iota. And iota at level of T12 will give you a celiac trunk which fronts out. And as you keep following iota cordially, there will be a superior mesenteric artery which comes out from the anterior aspect of the aorta. And further down at the level of L3, you can appreciate the inferior mesenteric vessels. It is easy to identify celiac and superior mesenteric uh, trunk, but sometimes IMA is difficult because its caliber is low. And at the same time, they, they are not in an axial plane. They go above, come down, so you cannot see them in a single plane. You may see a small circle, which you have to also follow in the sagittal and the coronal plane somewhat like this. So this is the descending iota. You have to follow these vessels in the other planes. This is the celiac trunk and this here is the superior mesenteric artery. So it is important to identify them. I will show you in the axial sections how to identify them. Apart from the arterial system, you also need to know the venous system. So there is a portal system as well as a hepatic venous system in the liver. We all know there is a dual uh, supply venous drainage of the liver. So the portal vein per se, it is formed somewhere at the pancreatic uh, neck by intersection of the superior mesenteric and the splenic. So here the portal vein is formed and as it traverses superiorly, it divides into the left portal vein going into the left lobe of the liver and the right portal vein which further divides into the anterior and the posterior branch. There's a left gastric vein also which enters the portal vein somewhere near the confluence. It, it enters where the, the, uh, the splenic as well as the portal vein come somewhere here, you will see on the posterior aspect, the left gastric vein also enters. Angiography is one of the best ways to actually understand the anatomy. But it does for contouring axial anatomy is important. So as you can appreciate in this angiogram, this is reflecting the arterial system and this is the venous system. So here you can appreciate the celiac artery, which I told you uh, arises at D12. This here, again divides into three branches. As you can see, this is the splenic, this is the common hepatic and gastric. And here it is the superior mesenteric. It is caudal to the celiac one. This is the venous one. This is the main portal trunk. And you can appreciate the right portal branch here. There is the splenic branch here. This is the strain here, which you can see. Splenic is more tortuous. You will appreciate more tortuality to the splenic in comparison to the rest of them. And this is the superior mesenteric vein, and this is the inferior mesenteric vein. So on the axial sections, if, uh, if you see, the origin of the venous system comes from the IVC. So first thing you should do when you're looking at the liver, first of all, find the IVC. In this particular section, it is within the parenchyma of the liver. Lower down, it may uh, se separate out from the liver parenchyma. So this dark area here is the IVC, and you can see three branchings here. So this is the left hepatic vein, this is the middle hepatic vein, and here is the right hepatic vein. This is the iota and this is the stomach. Further down, you can still appreciate the left portal vein and the uh, uh, middle and the, uh, uh, and the right ones, the anterior and the posterior are not well visualized now. This is IVC, this is iota, stomach, and you can see a bit of screen here. Further down, this is the gallbladder. This is, the annotations are wrong. This is the duodenum here, the bulb. And uh, this again, you can see the This is the celiac axis. This is the splenic artery, tortuous, going through the parenchyma of the, uh, the pancreas. Pancreas is a woolly structure. This woolly structure here is pancreas. It is traversing through its parenchyma and going to the splenic thylum here. This is the portal vein and this here is the common hepatic artery. Common hepatic artery is the most difficult amongst all to identify, especially in a post-op case sometimes because of a lot of uh, um, vascular trips, you may not appreciate uh, the uh, common hepatic artery well, but by virtue of your location, if you know it is here, you can still delineate the nodal station there. So this is the splenic as I told you, and these are the two kidneys. Further down, this is duodenum. This is the pancreas. Here is the CBD, which is going to open up into the uh, duodenum further down. And this woolly structure here is the pancreas. 
This is the superior mesenteric artery and vein, and this is the uncinate process of the pancreas. So this is something uh, I have tried to print some videos. This is how we would draw. Uh, we usually try to make different colors to different vessels so that it is easy to identify. So I'll just play it again. I have given some annotations also. So this is the iota, IVC. Here it has come out of the parenchyma of the liver. You can see the splenic, the superior mesentery. And the lower end of the vessels, ideally you have to draw at least to the L2 level because that would define as the lower caudal border of most of your portals, especially for pancreas. But at times you may need to draw much further down, which I will uh, tell you further down, uh, further along in the presentation. Second important thing after the vascular uh, anatomy is the segmental anatomy of the liver. So uh, this is one thing we all forget. We, we try to memorize, but I would always say that please put some post heads or some, you know, put it on your notice board so that you can, as a ready reckoner, so that you can see it again and again and it can be revised. So as you can see, you can remember it by the punch of a fist. When your thumb is inside your fist, your thumb represents the segment one. We have index finger two, three, the middle finger four, a four, b, the ring finger eight and five, and the uh, pinky finger seven and five, seven and six. So this is how you can remember. But how actually these divisions happen? I'll just teach you a bit about it. So this is the Quanat classification for the segments. So to divide the liver into the segments, you are using these four. Uh, um, uh, ROIs. One is the hepat right hepatic vein, the middle hepatic vein, the falciform ligament and the portal ligament. So the right hepatic vein here, as you appreciate here, divides the liver into the anterior and the posterior segments. The middle hepatic vein here divides it into the left and the right lobe and the falciform ligament which would come here would divide the left lobe into the two, three and the four. So somewhat like this, these are the three divisions. Finally, when you get the eight segments, each segment has a separate supply from the portal vein as well as the hepatic artery as well as the bile duct. So these are separate functioning units of its own. That is one reason, you know, after surgery, you can remove particular segments and liver continues to function because the vascular supply of all segments is independent of each other. So on the axial anatomy, this is how you would finally uh, find the segments to look like. There is usually no requirement of contouring the segment separately, but when you're drawing uh, the contours for gallbladder, you have to be aware where the segment four is because you tend to have it as a tumor bed and you include it in your volumes. Additionally, uh, the description in your reports by the radiologist will always mention of segments. So you have to be aware where actually the tumor has been uh, anatomically described with relation to the segmental anatomy. So next, before we actually go to the CTVs, I would say in this particular site, it is important to draw your OARs, or we also call them region of interest, ROIs prior to actually drawing the CTVs because they form the framework to the CTVs. Your entire CTV is based on the expansions as well as some um, abutments from these ROIs. So first draw them, we will call them the ROIs as well as the OARs. So you should first of all know how to delineate liver appropriately. Liver seems to be a very, very simple organ. I think even uh, when you start contouring, liver, lungs are the ones you would feel very comfortable drawing. But there are small, small uh, things which you should pay attention when you are contouring liver for hepatobiliary reasons. Because if you're getting for a mean uh, liver dose for breast cancer, it may not be that important. But when you're contouring for hepatobiliary malignancy, the liver should be very diligently contoured. So first of all, do not include the gallbladder into the liver. Do not include IVC when it has exited from the parenchyma of the liver. Then you just, uh, take it out from the liver parenchyma. And also, you have to pay attention to the portal vein. So as I told you, the thumb inside your fist, this is the caudate lobe. You have to look at the relation of the caudate lobe to the portal vein. When the caudate lobe is posterior to the portal vein, you should not include the portal vein into the liver parenchyma. But once this caudate lobe goes medially here, when the caudate lobe has come in medially, the segment one is visible, then your portal vein should be incorporated within the liver parenchyma. So that is how you have to draw the liver volumes for hepatobiliary malignancies. 
Additionally, uh, although uh, this does not hold much value for hepatobiliary, but for HCC, you also need to draw a structure for the hepatobiliary tract, which is very simple, nothing, but you have to draw the portal vein right from the splenic confluence till its bifurcation. And then you give it a margin of 15 millimeter, which represents the central hepatobiliary tract, which is important for treating malignancies by SVRT. If you're doing SVRT for cholangiocarcinoma or HCC, it, hold value, it holds value and you have to constrain it appropriately. Then the other organs, this, there's a huge plethora of organs which you need to contour for hepatobiliary malignancies, but always pay attention that you also have to include the organs which might be getting some spill dose. So just don't start drawing from diaphragm. You also have to draw the heart. You also have to draw the lungs and the soft figures, which might be abutting the paraortic portals with, uh, in, the, in, the, in the volumes, which are likely to be there if you're going up to D12. So draw the lower thoracic organs also. And if possible, draw the entire lung because if you're wanting to see mean lung dose, you need to have the entire organ in your uh, planning scan. Otherwise you will not get the actual doses. So uh, draw the liver, heart, this here is stomach. For stomach, you may give some water for distending it, but uh, if you're not treating GE areas, it is better to keep it void and because the expansion will keep changing every day. Ask the patient to come with same fasting status daily. If patient is being treated for any upper abdominal malignancy, ideally should be told to take a light meal two hours prior treatment. That avoids too many organ motions in the stomach level because they tend to uh, change your uh, 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 location of your hollow viscera because of the uh, different meal patterns. So uh, always have a light uh, meal prior to radiation, at least two hours gap. Then this is the screen. Though there's no need to draw each hepatic uh, vessel discreetly, but it is important to draw the portal vein as well as the CHD separately the iota and the IVC separately. Stomach should be drawn in totality, inclusive of its wall from the outer aspect. The bowel loops should be discreetly drawn separately, especially the small bowel, because the tolerance of the small bowel is lower, so you have to draw individual loops. You have to draw the kidneys, the entire corticometrillary kidney has to be drawn large bowel separately, stomach, duodenum. I will separately tell you how to uh, draw the duodenum. And primarily, all the organs which are likely to fall close to your CTV have to be drawn. So do not just uh, draw one kidney that the tumor might be localized to the right side. Your volumes are likely to cross the midline, so always draw both kidneys. So uh, more attention you need to have for the duodenum because this is one organ uh, sometimes difficult to identify, especially if you have not taken care during the planning scan to give some amount of water or oral contrast uh, around 10 to, you can give 25 to 30 cc of oral contrast or preferably water and make the patient lie to the right side for 15 minutes, then you can delineate duodenum properly. But in post-op cases where there may be a blind loop, you may not identify by a contrast. So you should know by the location where duodenum lies. Duodenum has four parts. It has the first part, which is a long part around five centimeters, which is retroperitoneal, which almost starts after the pylorus ends. It ends into a C-shaped second part. The C-shaped second part goes below the pancreas to give the third part. And the fourth part, which is more towards the left side of your abdomen. It's a beautiful paper from our very own um, Delhi um, group of Medanta, who have pictorially very beautifully described how you can delineate duodenum. So you have to follow the lead from the stomach. So you see the stomach, the pyloric end of stomach is coming towards the Medial, medial side of the left lobe of liver. And as you follow it further, you will appreciate a duodenal bulb. So as you see the pylorus of stomach here, there is a duodenal cap here. This represents the first part of the duodenum. It is somewhere around the first lumbar vertebra. And this loop tends to be within, between the two lobes, the left and the right part of the uh, say, lobes of the liver. As you further down, take it down, the first part continues to be visible along with the pylorus, but you can also start to appreciate the second part. 
and it is like a C loop as I told you previously. At this level, you will see both the kidneys. The left kidney is still visible when the first part of duodenum starts to appear. You follow it vertically. Uh, it, it goes uh, vertically. Uh, you can um, follow the sections above and below to interpolate, but then correct it at the uh, uh, muscle level. Do not uh, overdraw it because that will give you wrong dose constraints and you will misjudge the dose going to the duodenum. The second part continues and now the pancreas needle length starts to overlap it from the left side. And further down, uh, when you see the stomach ending and the pancreas also goes further down towards the medially, your first part will disappear in the next section. This, this is the part where D1 would almost disappear and totally what you see in the blue sign here would be D2 here. So this is D2. D2 goes on for almost, uh, I would say around, it, it is the longest part, it is around seven and a half centimeters. It, it goes on till the time you are appreciating the pancreas. Once the pancreas, the tail starts to disappear, you will appreciate the fourth part of duodenum here, which is the most difficult part to identify because it, it looks just like the uh, jejunal loop. So sometimes uh, it, it is a rough judgment, but as per this paper, they say that you, you can uh, identify this part as the liver is starting to disappear because after this section, there'll be no liver section. So this would be the fourth part of duodenum. As both these fourth part as the second part start to uh, uh, come towards the medial aspect, towards the aortic end. And this is the disappearance of the pancreatic head. And finally, the fourth part goes and you start appreciating the third part, which is in green. The third part is lateral to the aorta. And uh, it is the smallest part of the duodenum. It is appreciated in the very few sections. And unless there is some air or uh, some fluid in it, sometimes it is very, very thin and a linear uh, portion, very difficult to identify. Sometimes you feel as if it is a vessel there. So finally, the duodenum stays in the midline, just lying above the aorta and the IVC. So it is important because you delineate paraiotics here. It is one organ which is going to get very high and uh, high dose of radiation and its uh, delineation is important because there have been cases of duodenal ulcers in the early series when duodenum delineation was not diligently done. So this is how duodenum is uh, delineated. Also uh, localize it in the sagittal and the coronal plane and if you see in the beam's eye view you will actually appreciate the C and if you have drawn the stomach then it will be a continuous structure from the stomach shaping into like a sigmoid. Another thing which is important, which is very, very difficult, I think uh, very, very senior people also find difficulty in di identifying the pancreatic or jejunostomy. This is there in the post-op cases of pancreas. It is difficult to find and it is one of the important ROIs because you have to identify it and give it a margin when you're uh, planning a post-op case of CA pancreas. So first you should know how a pancreatic duct looks like. So this structure here, this Bully structure here is pancreas and if you appreciate there is a very thin line here sorry which is the pancreatic duct so when you have to identify pancreatic or jejunostomy you have to find the pancreatic remnant which is more medially and you have to follow some jejunal loop and see where it is coming and touching this pancreatic remnant and once you find that junction you usually expand it 0.5 to 1 centimeter to make it the jejunostomy anastomosis. So I would again highlight here, it is good to understand surgical steps also. Don't limit yourself by reading just radiation. Also talk to your surgical oncology friends, your DNB colleagues, and understand key steps for CA stomach, for CA pancreas, because once you understand the anatomical changes which happen after these surgeries, then only you will know where to look for the anastomosis. Like in this pictorial depiction, you see, this is the pancreas and here the jejunum is sued to the tail. So this is the PJ. Here, the tail has been removed. The jejunum is sewn with the head. So this is the PJ. And here, the, uh, the, there is a transverse split which has been done. This is the opened up pancreatic duct and the jejunum is sewn like this. So when you will look at them, so this was where it was sewn with the head, 
and this is the PJ here. I'm sorry, I could not add few legends in, in um, lack of time. This is the pancreas and this is the jejunum. So this is the PJ here. This here is the hepatico jejunostomy, which you may appreciate in some cases. You don't have to include it um, into the treatment volumes. Your area of concern would be pancreatic jejunostomy. So this is how you can appreciate. This is the pancreas. This is the jejunum, which is better delineated here because there is some air. So this is the pancreatic jejunostomy. So after some understanding the anatomy, now I think uh, the, you would have a brief uh, um, idea of how the volumes would look like once you know the anatomy. So what are actually the different types of hepatobiliary tumors we need to address? So it's a big, big basket of tumors. It, it includes the cholangiocarcinomas, the gallbladder carcinomas, as well as the pancreatic carcinomas. The cholangiocarcinomas in itself are further three types. They would be the ones which are limited within the liver par and parenchyma, the intrahepatics, the ones which are near the confluence, the perihilar, and the ones which are beyond two centimeters of confluence, that is the distal ones. So this is a almost, uh, I would say, uh, the intrahepatic further would be, I would uh, show you further into many categories, they would be, I would be classifying them. If you just look at cholangiocarcinomas, the majority of tumors would be located at the bifurcation. 60 to 70 percent are at the confluence, that is, at the junction of the left and the right hepatic ducts. 70% tumors are located here, and we also call them the clad skin tumors. A small segment, around 5 to 10%, are intrahepatic, and around 20 to 30% are the extrahepatic. So, if if somebody can tell me, if uh, Dr. Dudul, you can just tell me who, who could answer it. What is the classification system for perihilar cholangiocarcinoma? Anybody aware of it? Yeah, anyone can come forward. Please unmute yourself. They can write in the chat box. You can tell me if somebody could tell. <laughs> okay. Oh, Shobna would have to be. <laughs> She's been sitting with me since the morning. So, okay. Uh, rightly said, it's the Bismuth Corlett type classification. Please, just for yeah, Dr. Abita from. Medanta, she has also answered the okay. same. So it, it is good to read up the topic yeah. being taught to you. It is always important to try to read up the topic which is being taught because then you can clarify your doubts also. So the BC type are four. You have to start type one from the caudal to the most cranial end. So the type one would be which is below the confluence. Some surgical series say you, you take type 1 2 centimeters away from the confluence, but 2 centimeters is not a hard and fast rule. Some people also consider 1 centimeter away from the confluence as type 1. So the type 1s would be the ones which are below the confluence. And when you see the ERCPs, you will see a stricture and a shouldering away from the confluence. These are the two drops joining. This is the confluence and the stricture is away. Type 2 is more cranial. Type 2 starts to touch the origins of the hepatic ducts. So this is the right and the left hepatic ducts where would, they would have originated from the confluence. This would be the type 2 BC cholangiocarcinoma. Type 3 is the one which has actually entered into the hepatic ducts. So it would be 3A if the right hepatic duct has been invaded. It would be 3B if the left hepatic duct is invaded. And if both of them are invaded along with the confluence, that it is called the type 4. And type 4 ones are the inoperable ones. And you can appreciate here also, you see the dilatation here. You see a strictureous confluence and a stricture going right down to the PHD also. And then there is subsequent dilatation. So these are the different types. They are important more so when you are doing brachytherapy boost. For the external radiation, I would say, you still uh, can get away by not knowing the exact confines, but for the uh, brachytherapy boost, you have to be knowing the exact confines before all your margins would be in contact. Some people have classified gallbladder cancers also, but I, will, I would say that they really hold only a prognostic significance. So by virtue of the location of the gallbladder cancer, they can be hepatic bed type where the mass is penetrating into the segment four of the liver. 
they can be the hilum type when they are going into the neck and may further go into the cystic duct to become the cystic duct type or they may be a combined one where the bed as well as the hilum has been invaded or there may be a tumor which is confined to the gallbladder but not invading the adjoining structure but directly throwing a lymphatic metastasis or it may be a localized one where the tumor is totally confined to the gallbladder the t1 lesions with no nodal or uh, peri um, uh, uh, peri gallbladder spread so these hold prognostic significance but if you have if somebody quantifies you would also know where your ctvs would go if patient has quantified that it is a hepatic type or a bed type so you are going to be paying more attention to the areas which you think would be invaded so once you understand the type of uh, uh, the tumors and and you have embarked upon doing radiation either in a post op setting and or in a radical setting which have already been defined in the previous classes you have to first take inputs from all the imaging you have you use all the imaging modalities which patient has undergone for the diagnosis for treatment and even your planning scan and spend a lot of time for conducting the scan do not Uh, do your planning scan in a hurry because you have to give a lot of contrast to delineate the hollow vista there are uh, planning systems which uh, have uh, a provision of uh, you know uh, correcting the heterogeneity of your oral contrast there you can give liberally oral contrast or you can contour them and change their h values alternatively you can give some water as i previously told you for delineation duodenum and that can be Find your hollow vista. Do not give too much of a contrast because over distension is going to again change the uh, location of your hollow vista. And later on, they 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 on after the planning scan on the further IGRT, you may not appreciate the organ to be located at the same place. The radiological assessment is the backbone. And do have radiology friends. Have a cup of coffee with your radiology friends if you really want to learn contouring well. So uh, understand what is the best modality for a particular malignancy for delineation, and there is a difference. There there are some imaging modalities which are good for detection, but they do not give you a good anatomical mapping. For example, if you are just doing uh, imaging for detection of that dilatation of biliary radicals, ultrasound is a beautiful modality. to find the confines of the tumor then you have to add on ct scan on mri because that will give you more spatial information crcp mrcp beautifully depicts the biliary passage but as radiation oncologist if you are not well versed it is very difficult to interpret because you may pick up the wrong biliary tract which you are uh, trying to figure out it is already a thin tract of caliber you may consider it to be so you need to sit with the radiologist to understand the ERCP and MRCP MRI scores higher over CT in liver because it gives higher contrast ratios and infiltrative lesions like some cholangiocarcinomas which are in conspicuous on the CT scan will shine brightly on the MRI it also can help you to differentiate between the dysplastic nodules and other benign conditions for the malignant tumors this has a limited role per se for your contouring it primarily tells you whether there is some extra hepatic disease it may change your decision making vis-a-vis from the management aspect but sometimes if there is a tumor which has been treated previously supposing you treated a cholangiocarcinoma with sprt and the patient has a recurrence then it can help you to differentiate between an active tumor and a fibrotic tumor only value pet holds at least in terms of anatomical mapping for segmental anatomy it is the ct and mri as i previously also said but it is not just any ct or mri it should be always a contrast phased multi phase imaging because most cholangios as well as hepatocellular carcinomas have different uh, architecture in different phases of contrast enhancement the uh, the delayed scans usually show washouts which may be appreciated in the hccs as well as in the cholangiocarcinomas also so have a multi phase scan done and uh, you can read up i can share links of uh, how to understand these triple phase cts and mris you should understand how they are conducted because if it has not been done in the diagnostic settings you might have to conduct this multi phase ct for your planning scan 
I have briefly talked about it, how you can uh, time the contrast so as to obtain this multi-phase CT. So uh, you can take inputs from CT as well as MRI, as I previously told, and some uh, angiography based imaging can give you a 3D delineation of the vascular uh, anomalies, which can, you know, sometimes mimic uh, the tumor by uh, encasing the vessels or encasing the ducts causing dilatation and sometimes can even show you tumor thrombi. So uh, if an NGO has been done, again, try to understand the anatomical nuances of it. Biliary involvement uh, of the hilus can be depicted by the ultrasound as well as MR cholangio equally. So uh, these inputs can tell you whether there is involvement, but again, the spatial resolution, I would say you should try to get an MR if it can be done, it will add, it adds value. So I'll just in brief tell you a little bit about ERCP. So this is how ERCP uh, is um, uh, interpreted. This is a stage uh, type four BC. You see dilatation of both the ducts. The confluence is not visible. You can see some strictures here. So you can see that there is a dilatation. So by virtue of dilatation, you should know what is a significant dilatation. So you will call dilatation significant if the intrahepatic bile ducts are dilated more than 40% of the portal vein. So your portal vein appears thinner and your bile ducts appear almost 40% wider, then we will call it a bile dilatation. If the CBD dilatation is more than six millimeters, it is a significant dilatation. And if your gallbladder dia is more than five centimeters, is again considered significant. So it indicates there would be an obstruction distal to the dilatation. So you can look for the tumor at that site. This is an MRCP, this is a normal MRCP. You can appreciate the, uh, the CHD, the CBD, cystic duct. And here, this is showing a filling defect just where the ampulla, uh, ampulla operator is there. So here you can see near the uh, exit of the CBD into the duodenum, there's a filling defect, reflecting that there is a growth there. CT scan gives quite a lot of information, uh, particularly in advanced tumors. As you can see here, this is a pancreatic tumor. You can see that the celiac axis is encased from all sides and the iota also has, has been enveloped by the tumor. Here again in the uh, other section, you can appreciate here there is a pancreatic tumor, the dilated pancreatic duct. And you can see the corticomedullary phase of kidney here. You can see the renal vasculature. So definitely CT does give a lot of anatomical information. This again, a pancreatic tumor, which is here uh, loss, losing playing with the IVC, immediately uh, laterally infiltrating the uh, duodenal wall. But MRI scores in some situations. Sometimes the pancreas appears like mottled totally, but the moment you add an MRI, the tumor might shine out in that mortal pancreatic background. Sometimes EUS cannot pick small lesions, but MRI can pick very small lesions. So for diagnostic as well as for the concluding perspective, especially if you're treating the radical cases, the unresected pancreatic cancers, there would be value of pancreatic majorly for your volume delineation. Since nowadays we are doing those escalations, you would want to define the confines of GTP very, very diligently. So do consider MRI as a part of your planning process. So now how to simulate, uh, uh, just like any other site, you should have a position which is reproducible, comfortable. If you're not planning uh, to do SBRT, you can just use a backlog or a thermoplastic mask. Some people do in free breathing also but then you have to have image guidance. The position of arms is important. Since you're treating the abdomen, do not keep arms by the side because the beam entries are likely to be from the uh, flank sides and therefore it is important you preferably keep arms above the head. If patient is uncomfortable, it can be kept over the chest, but preferably above the head is a better position allowing for a lot of beam angles. Head first supine simulation is done try to have a multi-phase imaging. Slice thickness depends on whether you're doing SBRT or are you are going to do the conventional fractionation, but uh, do not take very thick sections, at least three millimeters of section if you really want to see the vessels well. Your area of interest uh, should cover at least the five centimeters above and below of your projected treatment area. 
if you can take a bit more especially as i told you when you're taking upper uh, lower uh, upper abdomen the lower thoracic organs also have to be completely included to actually get the real mean values of the dose to those organs if you are using uh, motion management or 4d ct you have to uh, also see that which phase of uh, scan you are going to do contouring on so you need to identify the set of images your final sections uh, final contouring is going to be on and as previously discussed oral and what contrast of water can be given for delineation so the timing of contrast which i was saying so there are uh, some machine related uh, uh, techniques wherein sometimes there is a bolus technique which tells you when to give contrast wherein uh, you uh, so when to give contrast and when to acquire the image for example if you give the contrast you keep the cursor on the iota and the moment the hu value of iota changes you acquire the scan that gives you the arterial phase or else you can just define some timelines after the injection of contrast you can acquire the arterial phase at around 20 to 30 seconds and if you wait for another 60 seconds the portal venous phase comes so these are important because they will give you the vascular anatomy better and if you are using for the hepatic the cholangiocarcinoma than the HCCs, your delineation of tumor will be much better by the phased CT scan. So once you have obtained these scans, then find out which is the scan, primary scan which you are going to use for contouring. Because if you're doing 4D CT, you will have a huge set of images with you. To winning, find out the phase you're going to contour on. Register your diagnostic with that particular phase. Don't register with everything because adding too much of this information delays, you know, uh, the uh, slows down your system. And also uh, later on, uh, it, it puts so much of data that you cannot delete so many images. So choose the right set of image which you want to contour on and register all your data set with this particular image set and use that one for your contouring. Few tips here. So. Uh, OERs, as I told you, since I uh, taught you all the OERs to start off, should be drawn prior to drawing your CTVs because they serve the backbone against which all your uh, CTVs would be expanded. So first contour the OERs because they will form the basis of nodal uh, stations. Try to use the best display of CT and MR. Change your window settings. Abdominal window setting is a good setting for abdomen, but many a times the fat strandings or the edges of the tumor can be better seen when you change your windows from the abdominal to the brain or the head and neck. So keep moving your windowing to get the best out of that particular planning scan. And at the same time, just don't draw on axials. Keep seeing your scans on the sagittal as well as the coronal sections because sometimes just seeing the axials, you are drawing very, very irregular volumes. If that's your volumes goes, you are not seeing your axial and uh, your uh, sagittal and the coronal sections. Understand the perfusion abnormalities also because of because these hepatobiliary malignancies, you will find many uh, areas of perfusion abnormalities which will be better understood by sitting with the radiologist because if you don't contour well, you will over contour your volumes leading to higher toxicity and sometimes you might have to decrease your doses to account for that higher dose which might go to the adjoining organs. For lymph node delineation, though I taught you the vascular anatomy, but of late, this there is a new system of uh, lymph node uh, classification which has been described in the recent times uh, atlases. So, a uh, uh, you should know about it. It is very difficult to memorize. I would not even prompt you to memorize. It is the new system of the Japanese Society of Hepatobiliary Pancreatic uh, Nodal Staging in which they have divided the nodal stations into as many as 18 stations. And believe me, you, this, this particular is the most consolidated, minimized form of it. Even the level 16 further has 12 kinds and all these levels have been divided, but they have surgical relevance. And as we know, Japanese series, they are very good at, uh, you know, lymph node uh, delineation and surgeries for esophageal, upper abdominal. So they have done a lot of work, but for the interest of uh, contouring you should know where these stations lie because the newer atlases describe the nodal stations in context to this classification system. So now we start off with the actual delineation of the lymph nodes. 
for lymph node delineation, as I told you that you need to first draw the vessels. The red here represents the arteries. The blue ones are representing here the veins, as I have put the annotations here. And the black ones are the other organs like the CBD, the pancreatic head, etc. So uh, this is somewhat a summation of what was taught previously versus what has been uh, advocated in these current Japanese-based classifications that how to draw it. So I have uh, made it uh, consolidated from both ends. So you have to start drawing the uh, portal vein right from the front of the IVC till the confluence. The confluence to the SMV or the SV as I elaborated earlier. This is how you follow it. This is the portal vein. You are going portally. This is the common hepatic artery. And this is the celiac trunk. And here you are going further portally. You draw all these vessels. This is the pancreatic head. This is the jejunal artery. These are the arteries you will hardly appreciate. I'm showing you so you can see it. Even if, if I did not have the annotation, I think these are very difficult because in the upper abdomen, you will see a lot of uh, vessels, but it does not hold much value in terms of um, the contouring. It's just for your understanding that there is a jejunal artery here. And these are the medial colic vessels, which are somewhere up anterior to the SMEs. So sometimes SMA and MCA get uh, confused when you're contouring. Iota has to be contoured uh, almost from D12 till L3. But as the RTOG says that uh, you should start off uh, from the area where you see the, the most cranial end of either celiac axis or the most cranial end of the portal vein or the PJ. Whatever is the highest, you start drawing your iota from there. And contour up to L2 ideally because usually for pancreas, if you see the lower border goes to the L2 by the conventional themes. But if your GTV is lower, if your GTV is at uh, somewhere L2 level, you're likely to draw your primary CTV lower than that. In that situation, you have to draw your aorta right away till the lower border of L3. The celiac vessel, uh, you don't have to continue drawing it till the um, time keeps saying it. You have to draw the proximal 1 to 1.5 centimeter of it. And SMA, you have to draw the proximal 2.5 to 3 centimeters. This is how the vessels are continued till the time the third part of the duodenum appears. And after third part of duodenum appears, then you do not draw the SMA. As I told you, only the, portal, uh, the proximal part of it is drawn. So once you have drawn the vessels, you would expand your volumes around these vessels to give you the lymph node station. So to start off, it is always good to draw individual uh, stations. It will improve your understanding. It will reduce your chances of missing that particular nodal station if you have individually drawn all stations. Once you are in practice, you've been doing it for years, then you can draw vessels as a common unit and expand it as a common unit. But to start off, always draw them individually. So previously, the previous, as, as I mentioned here, RTOG had a asymmetric margin for the paraiotic. For the other vessels, a 10 mm margin was given as an expansion for nodal CTV, but for paraiotics, they had an asymmetric margin. It was recommended to be 2.5 to 3 centimeters to the right side, 1 centimeter to the left side, 2 to 2.5 centimeters anteriorly, and around 0.2 centimeters, that is abutting the anterior edge of the vertebral body posteriorly. But the newer guidelines have reduced the margins to 10 mm, and they start drawing from the diaphragmatic aortic hiatus to the origin of the inferior mesenteric artery. So that is the change, and this you will see in the subsequent examples also that the paraiotics are just encasing the IVC full circumference and a centimeter of margin here, and posteriorly, it is just the antibody of the vertebrae. The reason being, because from the patterns of recurrences, you know that there are no recurrences in this particular area, and you also want to reduce their renal doses. Additionally, having said that, if there is a node here, and you see a gross node lying there, in that situation, you have to expand beyond the node's confines and give additional margin to that node also. So this is how the volumes would look. This is the common hepatic uh, and the hepatoduodenal ligament lymph nodes. These are the celiac group of lymph nodes. These are the paraiotic lymph nodes. 
this is the anterior pancreatico uh, uh, duodenal so for pancreatico duodenal it is a triangular slit which you could you can appreciate there is a small slit between the duodenum and the pancreas you just have to include that then uh, this is the uh, superior mesentery smln and this is the celiac this is the anterior pancreatic duodenum this is the triangular slit as i told you this is the duodenum this is the pancreas and this is the triangular slit here this is the inferior pyloric so apart from the anterior pancreatic duodenum the slit you draw a small uh, area on the head uh, on uh, i would say on the duodenal uh, lateral aspect which represents the inferior duodenum and i will be elaborating that which node to be included in which particular uh, part of uh, part, which particular malignancy here i am making you understand all of them so this again reflecting the parietic this is a superior mesentric this again additionally showing the splenic group of lymph nodes so apart from what we showed previously this is the splenic group of lymph nodes and uh, again superior mesentric so there would be a difference when you are treating the head as well as the tail of pancreas so that is why splenic is not reflected in and the previous set of images so this is how we do sorry so we have individually uh, expanded and then finally you boolean them to get a common structure it is good idea to individually make them as different colors for your understanding especially when you are starting off making these notes this is how they look once you are making them so the additional thing which the uh, guidelines allow and which is a norm that if it is going into a hollow visceral organ like stomach you can prop your volumes from there and you can just make it touch the outer wall of that hollow viscous do not let your volumes go inside stomach or inside the liver it can touch the outer surface so this is how you would get the nodal volumes once you have volume and this i am also depicting the when you have given a common volume in this the entire vascular structure was drawn as a single unit and a 10 mm margin was given over the entire unit so this is how you would appreciate the nodal volumes this is including the entire parietic celiac hepatoduodenal posterior pancreatic duodenal here and the splenic hilum so these are how your final volumes look like this is the parietic this is the superior mesentric and here you can see the volumes have been intentionally cropped from the viscera if you can appreciate this is the wall of the duodenum here it has been cropped from the duodenal wall it has been cropped from the stomach wall so that is how the final nodal volumes have to be delineated so what else we have to uh, take care of when you're contouring nodal i would now tell you later on in context to the separate malignancies which stations to take but whenever you're taking any post op case of hepatobiliary malignancies you need to understand the steps of surgery as i showed you how pj is a difficult area to identify especially in a post op case you cannot appreciate things because there are lot of structural changes because of movement of the small bowel the location of duodenum can always change there can be um, some uh, artifacts which can arise from the um, uh, the staples which are inside so be well versed it is a good idea to call in your operating surgeon to sit with you to make you understand which organ has reached where after that surgical anastomosis especially in the first four five cases maybe later on you would start to understand the nuances of these post op scans but it is a good idea to have a peer review a review peer review would include your surgeon as well as your radiologist keep the surgical and the pathological information right in front of you planning because there would be mention of areas where the margins would be falling short either they are positive there is pni there is lvi and you might want to add to the standard expansions to ensure that you are not missing on the microscopic details understand from the surgeon whether the clips which you can appreciate on the scans are of relevance or not you will see a lot of surgical clips which are there because they have uh, clamped the vessels to prevent the bleeding 
and many a times we presume that they would represent the tumor bed but they would not represent that they would know better where they have placed it for our convenience for our radiation portals or it is just a innocent surgical clip which we should not include into the bottom because adding um, uh, increasing the uh, volumes would decrease your uh, chances of achieving a good plan then try to fuse the scans which were pre-op there may be discrepancies but either you keep the scan handy in front of you uh, by virtue of some landmarks try to make a preemptive pre-op gtv and if you can fuse the images it can give you a faint idea of the uh, tumor bed especially where the uh, uh, margins are falling short you would want to localize those areas which you would not want to miss in the tumor bed so the rationale for ctv as i told you depends on the recurrence patterns as well as the natural history so why we are taking a different margin for different areas we will just walk through a bit through those uh, uh, evidence bases that why we take different volumes. So we'll start from the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas when we are delineating the uh, volumes. So uh, there is no sacrosanct figure given, but from the pathological series, it has been found that the macroscopic disease extension, uh, the microscopic disease extension beyond the tumor has ranged from 0.4 to 8 millimeters. And it varies for these three different types because the intrahepatic in themselves are uh, uh, three varied types. They may be mass forming, like this one here. You can appreciate a mass, or there may be periductal infiltrating. You don't appreciate the tumor. You you are appreciating the dilatation, but there is an inconspicuous tumor here. So it just represents as a bile, a bile duct thickening, which can be better appreciated on an MR. Or they may be intraductal, which is the most difficult to identify. You, unless there is a uh, dilatation of the, uh, the wall, you may not appear, uh, appreciate this thickening here. So you have to appreciate it very diligently. That is why there is the importance of acquiring thinner sections during the planning scan for the upper abdomen. So uh, by and large, this one of the studies from Bia et al. say that uh, the image-based GTV should be expanded by at least 10 mm, 9.8 just uh, reaches 10 mm, which would make it sure that at least you have by 100% accuracy included the entire microscopic disease. So for intrahepatic, the pathological series are recommending around 10 mm. So this is how you can appreciate the intrahepatic tumors. They are not conspicuous on the early phase after the arterial uh, late arterial phase and in the equilibrium phase you can see the enhancement since there is a lot of fibrotic reaction in this intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma sometimes you can see a pulling down of the capsule also so this would formulate your gtv here the intrabiliary as i showed in the previous uh, uh, slide panel also you cannot appreciate but you appreciate a dilatation distal to this thickening for the extrahepatic, there is a lot of variation in the CTVs because there are again different patterns to it. So the extrahepatic ones can be either papillary, nodular, or sclerosing. The papillary ones they form masses, and the nodular and sclerosing ones they go submucosally along the biliary tracts. And it has been seen that the spread in the papillary is to the tune of around 15 to 16 millimeters. The nodular is around. 10 millimeters and the sclerosing again could go up to 15 to 16 millimeters in most of the cases, almost 90% of cases. So it is considered that at least a 20 millimeters of your margin into the biliary tract would ensure that you have covered the tumor distally in 93% of cases and proximally almost 90% of cases. So initially people thought of 10 millimeters, but it is in extra hepatic it is a 20 millimeters distally, which is considered safe and established by multiple series, including the ones from Chang and Ibita at all. So this again is reflecting the uh, perihilar and the extrahepatic cholangiocarcinomas thickening of the wall, which is appreciated very faintly here. And when there is a stent, it is all the more difficult. In this particular case, you would not appreciate a tumor at all. You will see a dilatation. There would be ill-defined masses, but with a stent in phase, it is very difficult. So sometimes the stent per se formulates the surrogate. 
So you have to talk to the um, um, gastroenterologist who has put in the stent within uh, what are the confines and then that can act as a surrogate and also can act as a fiduciary on for imaging. This here reflects the uh, uh, stage uh, type 4 BC. You cannot see the tumor at all. You can appreciate the dilatation of the two hepatic ducts and there is an inconspicuous tumor here because of the infiltrated growth. So uh, basically, you, once you've identified the tumor with the incorporation of MRI, it would be 10 mm for the intrahepatic ones. The gallbladder cancers, they tend to have a more intense invasion because they are thin walled and they do not have a muscularis mucosae. So they have a tendency of uh, uh, invading the adjoining organs. For example, the hepatic types invade the liver and parenchyma, like you see here, you can see the entire uh, gallbladder bed uh, infiltrating, uh, infiltrated by the tumor and further down, you can see entire segment four invaded by the tumor and also lesion, this is the gallbladder you can appreciate here. So in gallbladder cases, there is no uh, series which has shown uh, the extent of microscopic disease, but uh, in advanced stages, it is said at least 25 millimeters, that is 2.5 centimeter of a margin into the hepatic parenchyma should be taken as a CTV. You do not have to go beyond the edges of the liver or beyond the gallbladder into the hollow viscera. The margin is primarily into the hepatic cell. So if I can just summarize what I said in the last 5-10 slides, that in intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, we will draw a 10 millimeter margin over the GTV to give your CTV primary. In the extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, you need a uh, margin of 20 millimeters distally into the graph, 25 millimeter proximally, and radially you will take 1.5 centimeters in all directions. In gallbladder cancers, 25 millimeters radially in the hepatic direction or any residual gallbladder volume, but not beyond the gallbladder. And by and large, it would encompass the entire segment four of the liver. That would be your CTV pre for the gallbladder. And nodal stations, uh, this is a atlas. I have given the, uh, the resource also for it. So it shows that in uh, the intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the major nodal metastasis has been found in these particular subgroups, that is the hepatic odiodinal ligament lymph nodes, the common hepatic artery lymph nodes, the paraiotics, the posterior pancreatic odiodinal left gastric, lesser gastric, right, and the left pericardial. So these are the nodal stations which you have to encompass in the uh, CTV node and as I have told you previously most of them are drawn by giving a 10 mm margin around the pertaining vessels. But you can refer to it because um, it is an easy reckoner which I have prepared for you. So this is how uh, the volumes would look for an intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma. You have to draw the GTV, you have to draw all the uh, vessels which I enumerated in the last uh, slide, this depending on the nodal station you are to include, give a margin, 10 millimeter margin around the tumor and expand the nodal volumes by 10 millimeters. And this is how your volumes would finally look like. Then for extrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, the recommendation, uh, CTV primary, I've already spelled out. For the nodal stations, you are to include the hepatodurinal, the left gastric, common hepatic, paraiotic, posterior pancreatic odurinal, anterior pancreatic odurinal. The additional one which comes here is the pericolodocal nodes, which also has to be included in your volumes, which is easy because you, you're drawing the uh, CBD. It, it usually uh, goes along with that. So again, Draw the vessels, give an expansion around the vessels for your CTV nodes as previously described. Draw the GTV and the uh, CBD and give a margin to find the primary CTV also. This steel color here, here is the primary CTV. For the gallbladder cancer, uh, once you've drawn the CTV, the nodal stations which you should be incorporating would include the hepatodurinal, the common hepatic, the paraiotics, posterior and the anterior pancreatic odorinal, pericolodocal. One more adds on, that is the cystic duct lymph nodes, which again can be easily uh, drawn by drawing either the cystic duct with a 10 mm expansion around it. So this is representing a gallbladder carcinoma contour, the GTV. You expand the GTV, you 
you have a 10 mm margin as you see you're not going outside the here we are, i have not given a margin outside the liver it is within the confines of the liver you expand the nodal volumes by giving margins to the vessels and this is how the volumes and if there is a gallbladder this is uh, intact gallbladder it hasn't been operated so you have to just take the entire gallbladder over you're not giving the margins into the abdominal cavity or any adjoining organ so the margins for gallbladder are into the liver intrahepatic component has a margin but not the one which is suspending into the peritoneal cavity then pancreas pancreas is a full fledged topic in its own this is how we have been traditionally seeing pancreatic uh, portals to look like this for the head this is for the tail but i would say the principles remain same if you see the beams i have view of the ctvs of the imrt plans for the pancreatic cancer they still look similar in terms of the craniocaudal extent just the fact is that your uh, ors are better delineated so when you are treating pancreatic cancers you would be either treating them as a post op adjuvant situation or you would be treating an unresectable radical or you may be doing pre op there is a upcoming role of pre op so the volumes would differ in the post op you are to identify a post op tumor bed you have to map what the tumor was from your pre op scan and then you have to find those anastomoses i talked about and that would confine your primary whereas for the radical rt you need mainly the main tumor so previous studies uh, the one uh, i quoted here from travata et al they were giving a margin to the primary tumor in the radical cases and the margins were so much so that you were going 3 cm into the pancreatic tissue not outside the pancreas then further on studies they coned it down to 2 and these are the dose escalation studies uh, as well as the ones for the sprt practically not take margins just take the gtv and it is believed that the nodal volumes when you take along with that accounts for the ctv over the primary so uh, still two two schools of thoughts are going on some people do give us ctv margin some don't some are take the middle path of giving a smaller margin but do not go beyond the parenchyma because as we saw in the very uh, few first slides that pancreas as i told you is like punching into the duodenum the moment you go outside pancreas you are literally treating the duodenum so confine yourself within the pancreatic parenchyma so find out the location of pancreatic tumor prior to the resection which can be obtained from fusing your scans or uh, you know uh, referring to them if you don't have the uh, dicom format to it the surgical clips particularly which have been mentioned across should be Uh, uh paid a lot of value especially the ones which have been placed by the surgeon for the close margins as well as the unseen margins because these are the areas where usually local failures happen so these have to be included and this this particular line i've taken from the rtog guidelines which say that you have to include only those surgical clips as rois which have been mentioned in the operative notes as if they have been specifically placed there for some tumor related parameters that margin close or unresectable or they felt that this is an area where my uh, um, the section is not uh, adequate but the status is not clear sometimes surgeon leaves a clip for the rt planning related purposes so you have to dig the operative notes for the post op cases or if they have been not been uh, spelled out in the operative notes do talk to the surgeon who can better guide you which clips are what elective nodal radiation for pancreas again it is becoming a pandora's box so uh, there is no consensus per se but there is a high nodal failure so most of the series have taken uh, nodal stations because of very high uh, lymphatic failure particularly in the pancreatic head cancers where uh, people have even seen that when you have an eni your uh, local recurrences are as low as 13% compared to when you have not done the local recurrences go up to almost 25% but current day sbrt series they are uh, uh, not doing nodal irradiation and pre op series are also not doing sbrt uh, nodal irradiation in some situation if it's a node node negative because the intention here in pre op is that you want to limit your volumes to reduce the surgical complications because you might be giving the pre op dose just to make the tumor 
uh, get away from the vascular structure which it might be abutting. So in these situations, nodal irradiation has been uh, given off in some, some series. So which nodal station to include when you are treating CA head pancreas? So the primary stations which you are to include are the infrapyloric, the common hepatic, the celiac trunk, hepatodurinal, posterior pancreaticodurinal, superior mesenteric, paraiotic, and the anterior pancreaticodurinal. So these are the uh, major stations which are to be included. When you take the body of the tail, I had, as I had shown, I had taken the splenic into the uh, tail, uh, uh, nodal irradiation of the tail. So you would take infrapyloric, common hepatic, celiac, splenic hyalur, splenic artery, hepaticodurinal, superior mesenteric, periotic, and inferior body lymphodes when you're treating the body and the tail. So this is what something which has been uh, you know, beautifully described by RTOG, although a lot of changes have happened when this RTOG guideline came in 2012. But their way of delineating is very systematic. I think the same can be adapted with the current um, changes which have happened, especially in the periotic delineation. So first delineate all your ROIs. That is what we did. We first delineated all our ROIs, which could form the framework for expansion. So what are these ROIs for pancreas? Portal vein, pancreatic jejunostomy, in some situations called it local or hepatic jejunostomy, but major, majority of cases, hepatic jejunostomy is out of your um, treatment confines. The celiac artery, the superior mesenteric artery, the aorta, and the tumor bone. So expansion one would include a one centimeter expansion over all vessels except periotics. And then expansion two would be the asymmetric expansion as I previously taught you over the aorta. Although now, since we have given off with this, so it would be a common expansion of one centimeter over all the vasculature. And then boolean them with the pancreatic uh, tumor bed or the contoured clips. Once you have boolean the entire structure, you can give at least a 0.5 centimeter of expansion over the CTV to derive your PTV. But PTV differs as per your institutional policies of whether, uh, what sort of uh, uh, um, setup you have, whether you have uh, used motion management in particularly those tumors where you see that there is a apprehending a motion of more than 10 millimeters. Be very watchful when you are expanding. So it is easy to boolean, but when you're boolean, you have to pay attention to these two, three areas. The posterior margin should not go more than 10 millimeters into the vertebral body. And if by all means you cannot find the pancreatic jejunostomy, then don't worry. Sometimes it can fall within your CTV when you are delineating nodal stations. But if you are not doing ENI, which is unlikely in a post op case, it, uh, then you can miss out the PJ area. But if you're doing ENI, by and large, PNI, PJ can fall within your confines. And uh, if there is a pancreatic or gastrostomy, that is not part of your CTV. Do not include it as a CTV anastomosis. And do not protrude into the dose limiting organs, as I previously spoke, the liver, the stomach. You can be uh, touching the edge, but do not enter into the musculature of the hollow viscera. So these are two cases which uh, were described in RTOG. Since they were beautifully described, I did not uh, want to miss out on them, although I have pulled out few from the other repositories also. So one of these cases, it's a uh, uh, CA pancreas T1N1, where a Whipple's has been performed. It's a margin negative uh, case with one of the 15 lymph nodes involved. So in this situation, the, the, the schema they show, that is how they've done. They have drawn the ROI, which would be the aorta, the portal vein, uh, the superior mesenteric, the uh, tumor bed, and the... Uh, the pancreatic jejunostomy. Uh, After identifying these ROIs, you draw the first expansion, which is the 10 millimeter expansion over the vessels as well as the tumor bed. And they have drawn the uh, asymmetric expansion of the aorta, which now we have uh, reduced to 10 mm again. And then they have bullion the entire thing, and this gives you the final volume. The extreme right gives you the final volume. So this is the ROI, the vesiculature the expansion one and expansion two, and this is the final volume. And it is important to look at the final volume. It, it is like a bean. It, it looks like a bean. And always see uh, how it, uh, what is the extent. So you always count the vertebral bodies to see whether you have reached the L2 level. Because traditionally you have been treating there. Although since now we are doing more vessel-based, there may be some aberrations you might 
be uh, somewhere some between L3 sometimes, but do not miss the uh, inferior pancreatic odorant nodes because uh, that could be a site of failure if you have uh, cut short on your uh, caudal puncture. And this is another case, this is case two, this again from the archaeology atlas. Uh, this is a case where uh, a Whipple's has been done. It is node negative, but there is a positive microscopic margin at the atrophic and the inflamed pancreatic margin. So in this case, it is important to identify this particular spot where the uh, margin would have been positive, that is the tumor bed. So you draw the ROI, which include the vascular structures. You draw the PJ as well as the tumor bed and in this particular case there is a bigger volume as you see quarterly there's a bigger volume than what you saw in the previous case so after the expansions this is how the final volume would look like so ROI expansion and the final volume so once you have drawn the CTV then you have to draw the PTVs so PTVs as I previously told you is determined by your institutional policies, what sort of setup errors you have at your place, is also determined by the type of immobilization you have used, what motion management strategies would be done, especially for the intrahepatic malignancies, whether you would be doing image guidance and how frequent you would be doing the image guidance, that would determine. Because if you're doing some tracking and guidance, you can go even as low as 1.5 millimeters, especially if you're tracking it. Tracking and getting is different. Right? So if you're tracking it, especially the CK based treatments, you can go up to 1.5 millimeters. But by and large, the NAC based treatment where you are not using any breath control or tracking, minimum of five and sometimes seven millimeters of margin may be required readily. And your craniocordial margin should be ITV based. It should be determined by the amount of motion the tumor has. Then maximum, it should not go beyond 10 mm. If it is going beyond 10 mm, you have to incorporate some motion management. If you're using 4D CT margins, then three to five millimeter margin of PTV would be adequate at your center. OARs should include the entire plethora of organs, which I uh, showed you right from the normal liver till the central hepatobiliary tract. If you're doing SBRT, also draw skin, also draw chest wall, also draw diaphragm. There are uh, no hard bound uh, guidelines for drawing them. We all have been drawing by hit and trial. Uh, skin usually represents uh, the five millimeter of uh, white area which you see beneath the thermoplastic mask. Don't take the thermoplastic mask within the skin. Diaphragm, you can appreciate the crust and the entire boundary over the liver. And that can, uh, it is more so important if you're doing stereotactic high dose radiation, ablative radiation, not for your conventional radiation. So a few more examples. I thought we might not have time, but I think we have some time to cover them. So this is a hyalur cholangiocarcinoma case. Uh, this, you can appreciate the CTV here, which is drawn by expansion around the uh, biliary duct, common hepatic duct. This is a margin. And then lower down, you have added the margin to the nodal station by identifying the portal vein. And here the SMA, the pancreatic odorant, and this is the ampulla. So this is how it would look on coronal section. This is a CA gallbladder. It is important because it's a post-op case. So here you can see that there are surgical clips here. You would also see a clip here, but these are not the ones which you have to include. So the entire segment four, which represents the gallbladder uh, fossa, the portal, the colodocal, the cystic, so here, entire tumor, board, the tumor bed and the nodal stations. And once you reach beyond the liver, now since you can see, as you see here, you have included all the pertinent staples, but once you see another hollow viscera here, then you don't have to add a margin. This is, I particularly wanted for this. I somehow wanted to pull out a lot of cases from my own repository archives, but the uh, paucity of time did not allow me to do so. So this is lower down where you are tracking the CPD. This is a case of C pancreas. Uh, here, as I was telling you, now current time uh, contours are not giving margins. This is just to highlight that 
who are just taking the GTV. The CTV uh, is basically taken as the nodal CTV and after uh, bullying the both uh, CTV primary as well as the nodal, a PTV has been added. So there is no additional uh, CTV into the pancreatic parenchyma. This is it's a case of unresectable pancreatic tumor. Stomach, this is stomach, this is the pyloric end of stomach, pylorus, this is the pancreas, small bowel, red is the small bowel, duodenum, here the pancreatic head you can appreciate and this here is the pancreatic head with the uncinate process. So you do not extend your volume into the small bowel just confining yourself to the pancreatic tissue. And once your third part of duodenum appears, your pancreas disappears, your CTV primary also disappears. This, I think, this is one of our uh, cases of unresectable pancreatic tissue, just representing the GTV primary. This, this volume here is just representing the GTV primary showing just the tumor. Since the tumor was encasing the vasculature, the entire volume has uh, been taken into. And once the small, uh, large bowel appears here, and this is the duodenal fourth, third part, this is the duodenal second part, converting into the third part, the volumes have been stopped here. And this I have already taken. So I think uh, since pancreas was a big topic, I have actually abbreviated it a lot. I did not realize that we can go on for the class for a longer time. Uh, I should have asked Dr. Dudul previously. So I would conclude by saying that uh, principles of radiation remain to be same across all techniques of radiation. But in the current era radiation technology, you have to be very, very pertinent in getting all the information you can have in terms of imaging because accurate localization and very, very uh, watchful implementation is essential for performing these high-end techniques. You have to understand the radiological anatomy. You have to also be well-versed with key surgeries of upper abdomen to actually do good uh, planning for the upper abdominal cases. Judicious selection of image set is warranted because as I told you, you know, on a early arterial or maybe a plain scan, you may not appreciate the tumor at all. Unless you have done a multi-phase scan or you have incorporated a multi-phase MRI into your planning, you will be very, very wrong in contouring. You will over contour because infiltrative lesions with poor borders cannot be appreciated on uh, the simple CECT scans. Visualize your contours on all the planes. It is, it is a golden rule for any site in the body. When you're contouring, do not restrict yourself to axials. Keep checking your volumes in other planes also. And also keep changing the window levels. Because many a times by changing the window levels, you may see fat strandings, you may see irregular borders, which are better appreciated when you change your windowing from the abdominal windowing to the head and neck or the brain windowing. Look for your potential areas where you can falter. And these usually are the wrong or the incorrect tumor bed definitions. Or when you're fusing two images, you may wrongly draw the pre-op volume at a separate place. So just do not always go by the bony anatomy. Also check, check other landmarks, uh, which can help you to better delineate the tumor bed. And always take a peer review, which could include your own colleagues, it could include your surgical friends. It could definitely should involve in hepatobiliary. I would say you should definitely make the radiologist have a look at your uh, contours once. The RTOG studies have actually uh, recommended that the final volume should be, uh, especially in the SBRT series, should be at least seen by the radiologist once who should be part of the study. So please make it a teamwork and uh, be very, very well versed with the anatomy. These are the resources. Uh, I can share the full text if you would want to look at the detailed atlases. And I thank you all for a patient hearing and would definitely love to take questions. And extremely sorry, uh, I had a lot of videos which I got them short from my planned repository. For some reason, my videos have not been connected with this particular presentation. So over to you, Dr. Dudul.
Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, it was extensively discussed, and GI radiation oncology definitely is one of the toughest area of uh, where radiation oncologists find it very difficult to get the satisfaction because of a lot of difficult organs at risk in the surrounding region. And uh, personally, I know how difficult is this to cover all these three humongous topics in one session. But uh, you, as, as we are uh, doing extensive sessions, even then I am finding it very difficult to give a proper time to one class, which it should be given. Like uh, this month, we are having almost 19 or 20 classes. And uh, even then, it's becoming very difficult to have one session on one particular uh, delineation aspect. But I think from the postgraduate side, uh, the amount uh, of information they need from the exam perspective would be good enough with the amount of information we are giving them because this is what they want to know. What is the yes. area we need to treat? Doses I haven't discussed because I thought it is totally a contouring and uh, a lot of things had been discussed by Dr. Reena. I've been told that she has beautiful yes. across, uh, all the uh, evidence. So I did not confirm, you know, venture into the evidence also. No, and, I, and I think that uh, you have done, you have done uh, excellent. So uh, not frankly not speaking, that. within one and a half, half hour, you have uh, in detail discussed all the principles of contouring of OARs the CTVs, the PTVs, the GTVs, and uh, shown your uh, personal case videos, contouring, and I don't think uh, there is anything left in this topic. And I have request the students and whoever is attending this class, yeah, if you have any question, please unmute yourself and you can ask if there is any question from your end to ma'am. It is a difficult topic, I think. Uh, so that it is more so my, so my, my personal uh, experience is uh, not many centers are actually doing uh, dedicated GI, uh, dedicated radiation oncology practice, particularly in terms of this uh, hepatic malignancies or pancreatic malignancies or uh, biliary malignancies. So most of the time, what I see that uh, it's like surgery and uh, all uh, by the medical oncologists, all chemotherapy, and only few centers having very good support of radiology, GI surgery. They are practicing to some extent this uh, practice of radiation in hepatic, uh, hepatic biliary and pancreatic malignancies. And the same thing was being shared by Dr. Uh, Renan Engineer also that not much centers are actually doing these things. And she also was saying that we, I feel that uh, we should be more proactive in promoting radiation in this area. See, I think now we, have, we have a much more uh, better gadgets compared to what there was in 2000 or 2005. So I agree. I think practicing clinicians, we, the struggle here is to convince people. It, I think everybody in their multimodality tries to convince the uh, the real value we are adding to say gallbladder. Because still now, uh, most of the medical oncologists uh, are reluctant to get uh, radiation done for CA gallbladder till date, despite having a good, uh, you know, uh, evidence. I, I can say it is not uh, randomized mm -hmm. phase one, but a good amount of evidence even for pre-op from TMH, from uh, Chile, and three countries are saying that pre-op CTRT for gallbladder is workable. So it is, it is still a fight. I think uh, that fight is ours, but I think we can convince them if we do good work. But for that good work, it is important that it is done diligently at our end. We cannot take uh, contouring of upper GI very, very lightly because the maximum havoc can happen with such critical hollow viscera all around our uh, target volumes. Yes, that's true. And I think a lot of... Uh, uh, sir, please, please carry on. Sir, Dr. Sandeep Jain, sir, has some question for you, ma'am. Sir, please... A uh, very useful uh, presentation. Um, my question is regarding the uh, pancreas post NACT setting. If we are planning to do a CTRT, then uh, what should be the CTV primary? Can the margins be reduced? Okay, so I think uh, Dr. Nitesh is also asking. Uh, 
sir i think it's your question only so uh, so though there is no uh, head on comparison or any uh, data saying that you can reduce your margins but as such it is the uh, parenchymal margin which should not be compromised that is what the principles of uh, radiation and adaptive after induction chemo says that at least the parenchymal element if not 3 cm you should still at least consider giving a margin of a cm into the parenchyma but uh, i i would not say that i have a big series to support that these are uh, anecdotal and small series which have said that you can reduce margins but uh, zero margin into the parenchyma is not desirable dr nitesh anand has a question regarding uh, what we actually practice now for parabolic nodal contouring is it a symmetric or asymmetric margin so uh, now we don't go 2.5 to 3 cm the uh, current practices are to go for 1 to 1.5 cm so the series of at least taking one but i think in the upper abdomen to the left side 1.5 is the uh, maximum limit of uh, radial expansion which we are following uh, personally i feel on the, the nomenclature the rtog has given like para aorta it should be actually edited to aorta cable like thing because the contouring guideline they mention that includes para aortic aorta cable and para cable everything so the name itself is a bit confusing but there is a very nice paper it would not be in context of um, uh, hepatobiliary it, there is a very nice paper on para aortic contouring for reduction of duodenal toxicity in carcinoma cervix i think it is from dr berrywal's group you should look yeah. at it is it is beautiful and they have reduced margins even 0.8 towards the vena cava yes so, uh, yes absolutely they are reducing the margins so uh, it is it is an era where 10 mm may not be sacrosanct but you can asymmetrically expand but to a lesser volume rather than going 2.5 to 1.5 people have come down to 1.8 and even 0.6 posteriorly but that is in context to cervix so uh, whether we can draw a corollary from cervix into hepatobiliary still not i i would not uh, compare that absolutely true ma'am because the pattern of recurrences and uh, the regional drainage everything is different between these two group of malignancies so i i think there is uh, no more question from uh, this session and thank you so much ma'am for your time and for this wonderful presentation most welcome next time give me more time before the presentation i i, I must say i am really sorry <laughs> okay. and i think given that i yeah. i just gave you 48 hours time and you did a wonderful job it it is my it is my i mean honor to be doing it for you i think it, it is it is a good opportunity to interact with students and we would love to be students for life and learn more every time uh Uh, sir, sir. Yeah, please. Hello, uh, yes. sir. Ma'am, ma'am, ma it was a wonderful class for us, ma'am. Ma'am, one question: Is there any difference between SMA contouring for gallbladder and pancreatic cancer, or like SMA nodal contouring? No, SMA. As I told you, you have to draw uh, around one point five to two centimeters. Yes, ma'am. Uh. Then you draw over it for pancreas. Okay. So, by and large, what happens is when you are taking the primary. your primary mm. volumes are slightly lower already so it you end up treating mm. more instead of more. l3 and you reach mid l3 l3 so okay. for intention of treating sma it is because okay. of the virtue of gtv and the primary GTV. treatment for okay okay, okay ma'am thank you ma'am thank you so much ma'am so okay ji you get one good night have a good night and good weekend thank you good night everyone